I want to say what an honor it is to be here. Um, uh, thank you to Simeon and the whole team at the Delphi Forum for inviting me. It's, uh, it's a great honor to be in such a special place to, to talk about these important issues. Uh, I am extremely impressed that these three amazing uh, uh, contributions were given off the cuff, so you'll have to forgive me if I read from a bit of a more prepared uh, speech. One day I hope to, to have the, the ability to do that. So, um, so as we meet today, the world seems to be in disarray. The models and frameworks which have largely prevailed for the period since 1945 all appear to be under threat. For many years after World War II, the United States was not only by far the largest economy in the world, but also deliberately and proudly the most committed globalist country, determined to use its influence to promote international integration, to push for ever greater cross-border trade in every part of the world, and to be an active enthusiast for global and regional initiatives to tackle disease, reduce poverty, and more recently to cope with climate change. For much of the post-world era, the US was challenged by the Soviet Union in what seemed to be a bipolar world. In reality, however, the failings of the Soviet system meant that it was a very unequal contest. When the USSR collapsed in 1991, it soon became clear that its economic performance and military strength were often as mythical as its supposed ideological appeal. We briefly entered a time when it was thought that we had a unipolar planet. The US in the last decade of the 20th century and in the first decade of this one seemed beyond challenge. Serene in an unmatched technological supremacy, its ideas and ideals of democracy and capitalism appeared to be near universal in their appeal. So a shift to, the, to a multipolar world seemed to some both inevitable and desirable. A stronger, more integrated Europe could help share the burden of promoting liberal values. A wealthier China and a rising India would spread prosperity to new corners of the world while providing growing markets for the benefit of all. Russia would be different from its neighbors but could work peaceably with them. America would still lead but the burden would be shared and others would start to have their chance to step forward and to step up. Much of that now seems in question. Today, the USA, at least reading the initial signals of the past 37 days, no longer seems to want to lead efforts for more trade, more democracy, and stronger collective security. Russia appears far happier to do things on its own than to seek to lead the international community as a whole. Meanwhile, economic power is visibly draining away from the old NATO and OECD blocs towards Asia, whose governments still face so many pressing issues within their own countries and regions for whom a global leadership role is not, at least not yet, a practical or immediate focus. Far from moving towards a genuinely multipolar world then, where several countries or blocs compete or cooperate to lead, we seem to be closer now to a world with no pole at all. As my friend Ian Bremer calls it, a G0 world. Right now, if America steps back, it will create a vacuum. And from there, it is unclear what will happen. All this might amount to what Thomas Kuhn called a paradigm shift, a profound change in the underlying framework of assumptions which have guided countries, businesses, and individuals. It all seems a long way from the heady days of a quarter century ago when American leadership ensured that the Berlin Wall was turned, uh, torn down, that Eastern Europe would be set free, and that open markets would be embraced from Beijing to Bulgaria. Francis Fukuyama fam famously wrote then of the end of history because only liberal democracy would survive. History is bitten back. And now even the US seems to question the virtues of open borders and markets of internationalism and of global communities. In recent weeks, I've traveled around the world and met people across different countries and continents who share a sense of deep bewilderment about how this has happened in the United States and what it might mean. In Colombia, where I was last week, where my organization Concordia hosted a summit that was attended by the sitting president of the country as well as uh, all the cabinet and three former presidents, enthusiasm for the peace process is clouded by uncertainty of whether the US will contribute financially to help pay for a better future. Here in Greece, an absence of American leadership to promote global financial stability is obviously a major concern. In Mexico, people are still stunned and uncomprehending about what is happening in their northern neighbor and what this may mean to their family and their working lives alike. 
If this sounds at first like a criticism of the United States, let me be clear. I am and always will be an unambiguous fan of America. It is without a doubt a force for good in the world and over the last hundred years has been the single greatest positive force acting upon human destiny. So I'm very far from being someone who wishes America ill, still less one who rubs his hands at evidence that it may want to step back from its position of global predominance, quite the opposite, in fact. When the US is strong and engaged, it has spread peace, prosperity, and freedom. It has helped clean our shared environment, increase the liberties and life chances of disadvantaged groups in every kind of society, and has led our species to new pinnacles of technological achievement. The world benefits when America leads, but so do Americans. The US enthusiasm for free trade has made it possible for American consumers to enjoy the highest standard of living in the world. When a Walmart customer in Michigan buys an orange or a resident in Florida gets a large screen television for their home, they benefit from a truly global supply chain which works across countries and continents and which is good news for everyone involved. When America built and defended NATO, created alliances in Asia, and reached out to form partnerships with its neighbors in Canada and Mexico, it safeguarded its own families and homes, just as much as those of its allies and friends. In the long run, my view and the view of our business and our family shall always be, don't bet against America. It is a country with a people who have always come through and always grow stronger in time and they have a unique ability to adapt to circumstances that has been seen throughout its history. But what about the short term? What can those of us who believe in openness and liberal values do right now? The most immediate task I suggest is to make the messages for our viewpoint as clear, direct, and engaging as those are on the other side. Making your words simple does not mean being simplistic. It means communicating well, which we have so often not done. The greatest clarion call for freedom in history came in Philadelphia in 1776. We the people declared straightforwardly that we hold these truths to be self-evident. So today, as I wrap up, let us hold some other truths to be self-evident. Open hearts are always better than closed minds. Free markets are the essential underpinning, not only for prosperity, but for every other kind of freedom too. And we are at our best when we work together to tear down the walls which divide us, not when we look for reasons to put them up. Our world needs that kind of America, an America proud of its ideals and proud to lead the world in pursuit of them. Our task should be to help make that day come back again soon. Thank you. Ευχαριστούμε και εμείς κύριο Λογοθέτη. Ε, ξέρετε, το τελευταίο διάστημα μετά την εκλογή Τραμπόλη συζητάμε το ενδεχόμενο η Αμερική να κλειστεί στον εαυτό της βάση βεβαίω και των πρώτων δειγμάτων της πολιτικής του κυρίου Τραμπ. Ε, αυτό θα σημάνει και το τέλος της ε, ηγεμονίας της Αμερικής στην παγκόσμια σκηνή. Sorry, could you repeat the question because I didn't, didn't catch the first part. Μετά την, τα πρώτα δείγματα, λέω, της, της πολιτικής του κυρίου Τραμπ μας κάνουν να συζητάμε άπαντες, αναλυτές και εμεί, το κίνδυνο η Αμερική να κλειστεί στον εαυτό της. Αυτό θα σημάνει και το τέλος της ηγεμονίας της στην παγκόσμια σκηνή. I think uh, the answer to the question uh, has to be we don't know yet. Uh, Donald Trump has been president of the United States for such a short amount of time and there are so many issues that the President of the United States faces. As I was saying, everywhere you go, uh, bar very few countries, the United States plays a role. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is a large portfolio for any President of the United States to encounter. So uh, you, we need to give him a little bit more time to understand. I, you know, I, I, I can't say for sure, I'm just speculating, but there are many issues that I'm sure he hasn't thought of yet. He hasn't thought what should be the role of the United States. And so, as we go over the next months and see, um, I think uh, the answer to that will be more clear. Uh, if uh, President Trump decides that the United States should be less involved in the world, um, I think that that is a very negative thing for us all. And um, I sincerely hope that, that he can see that that would not be a positive. So we'll see. <laughs>